Glorious and mighty God, we approach your throne this morning with complete confidence, God. You, you are a God who is amazing and um, your greatness, your power, your love, your insight, your creativity, all those things and many, many more, God, are what allow us to approach your throne with confidence. It, it is not because of anything that we have in and of ourselves, but it is because we know you love us. We know that no matter where we stand today, how we're feeling today, what we're going through, what sin we committed right before we started this call, we know that you love us, God. You love the sinner. Um, and, and when you rescued us from the sin, we were deep in sin. You know, Paul describes us as, as enemies of Christ, of enemies of yours, God. And yet when we were in that state, not when we had made ourselves better, not when we had corrected everything, but in the state of sinfulness, you loved us and rescued us and redeemed us. And we live today in the power of that redemption, God. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I just think of these times where we get together in the morning, we talk about you and we just look at one aspect of you um, and we're deeply encouraged. Our soul connects with that, Father, that part of us that Solomon said is eternal, um, that whole, that whatever you want to describe it, that place loves that, loves that we look into your word, loves that we commune with you, loves that we commune with each other. Our soul truly sings um, when we do what we're doing this morning, when we love you and we are in community together loving you god and i thank you for that privilege i thank you that i live in the 21st century uh, i thank you that as dark as times can get um, we have this ability I, I think of how encouraging it was god that um danielle and rob and, and nicholas drove out here and went to everybody's door to say hello and just to see how everyone was doing face to face. And it was so funny because we we're laughing at how we wanted to just hug each other, but we couldn't. And uh, just that, that, that connection of souls, it's, it's powerful. We have that privilege. We live in a country where this is possible, where we do not have to hide our faith or hide our love for you. We can literally go outside of our house if we wanted to and shout as loud as we want. I love God, and that would be perfectly okay. We may not be seen as sane, but it would be completely legal and safe to do that. And I am thankful today that we can do that. I'm thankful, God, that our times together can be posted on a, on a platform where others may hear and be encouraged and maybe be inspired to turn to you. Thank you, God. Thank you that we serve a mighty God. Thank you that you have blessed us. I want to offer up a prayer this morning, Father, for firstly, those who do not have the freedom of the gospel, who live in countries where it is illegal to preach your word, who have died for their faith in this generation, not just the first century. I want to pray, Father, for those who are in deep need because of this pandemic and because of the challenges of that pandemic. I, I thank you. Um, you are the God of peace and the God of love and the God of provision. Um, I beg you, Father, in, in some way provide for those people, God. I want to pray, Father, for all those that have been affected emotionally, mentally, physically by um, the racial injustice that people are feeling. And um, it's just been astounding to me to see protests all over the world. It's it's. For whatever reason, this particular thing has ignited um, a worldwide mission, and it's awesome. It's great. Injustice, no matter how it's seen, is wrong. It is not what you desire. Jesus, Jesus spoke against it, God. He always looked at the lowly and lifted those up and treated them special, just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12. And thank you for that, God. I pray for this time in our world, in our country, in, um, in the United States. I pray that, Father, out of it, firstly, that people will come to know you, 
And secondly, that those of us who do know you will, will seek deeper to love and to find out what that unconditional love really looks like, Father, in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. We thank you for this time. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I literally, as usual, as I always do when I pray a long time, I was going to say, sorry for the long prayer, but I'm actually not sorry for the long prayer. <laughs> I actually think prayer is, is awesome, powerful, and I'm not going to apologize for praying extended for an extended time because there's power in that. But anywho, good to see everyone this morning. For those who jumped on the call that I can't see because my iPad only has nine um, things, uh, welcome this morning. Um, it's so encouraging and great to be able to um, continue this topic of mental health, which I think I misled you last Friday. Um, I thought that that was going to be the end of it. And then Tony was like, no, I said two weeks. And then I was like, but I thought you changed it. And he was like, no, I didn't. He was like, amen, I was wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to continue the theme at least to the end of this week. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, and yesterday, Tony talked um, about a community, about our relationship with each other. He talked about Romans 12. Um, he talked about not transform, conforming to the ways of this world. Um, and it's interesting, my, you know, my mom and I often, when we're listening to Tony, we're upstairs together. And so when it's over, we always have this like interaction where we're talking about what was just talked about. And for her and I, the, um, the, the conversation has consistently been about what's happening in the world and race, because again, as many of you know, um, these kinds of things deeply affect my mom and dad, given the country they were born and raised in and begun to raise their kids in. And, you know, the very, raising us is the reason they left because they felt like they could not raise another generation in an environment that was set up this way. And so we have these discussions all the time. And, you know, the idea of community is so powerful, right? And you can see why Jesus, God, wanted community. You can see why he orchestrated us as Christians to be in community. Because when we're on our own, we have a relationship with God. It's easy to deceive yourself and say, I'm close to God. I love God. I feel connected to God. But when you step out of just the cocoon with you and God and you start to interact with other people, like the Bible says, it's when you really see, do I love? <laughs> Am I humble? Do I care? You know? Am I quick to listen, so to speak, slow to speak? You start to see so much more of your character, so, so much more of who you really are in community. And in community, you see and experience people who are not like you. You know, human nature, our natural instinct when we look for community outside of God is we look for people like us, right? It's why we have a Chinatown or we have a little Italy or we, why? We look for people who are like us. We are drawn to um, that familiarity, that, um, that, that commonality. I may, know, I may not know you, but I know some things about you. And <laughs> that is enough. We speak the same language. That is enough. Um, and that draws us to each other. But the thing about God, right, the thing about community in God is the language we speak is not, you know, French or English. The language we speak according to scripture is the language of love. That's the thing that binds human beings together or it ought to bind us together. That's the thing that's meant to bind us as a, um, a faith community together. And yet, if you and I are honest with ourselves and we look in society and we look at faith communities, we know that's not happening. That's, that's not happening. And so the question begs is, is it just about being a part of a faith community? Or is it about being 
actively involved in each other's lives. And I want to say this because I think with what our churches have gone through, discipleship, discipling each other, and yes, I will use that word, discipling each other, okay? Being in, in each other's lives in a way where we're loving, encouraging, we're a shoulder to cry on, we're an ear to listen, but we are a, a sword sharpening each other, where we are admonishing each other, where we're putting courage into each other. That's what it means to encourage. It means to literally put courage in, where we are a body of believers that it matters to us that each other go to heaven and it matters when we don't see each other reflecting Christ and we love each other enough to say, Hey, can we talk? I, this, what I see here is not healthy and I want to help you. I think I'm going to speak from my own experience and what I learned about this kind of community where we're helping each other. I think from my perspective as a leader, right, being the one teaching these things, I think my malnourished concept of discipling one another, of being involved in each other's lives was, was this is the directive of scripture. This is what we ought to do. And then we, therefore we as Christians have the authority in each other's lives. It doesn't matter who you are, whether I know you or don't know you, if you're a Christian, I have the authority in your life to challenge you and to call you to be like Christ. On some level, that's true, right? If, if I'm a Christian, then I should hear the cycling from anybody. But, but if, I, if I put love in there, <laughs> which it was always meant to be in there, by the way, if I, if I put love as the foundation for why I'm doing what I'm doing, then it matters how I say it and who I say it to, right? Because if I have a friend and we have an automatic language of love, there is trust, there's understanding. I don't have to couch things. We, we exist in that language of love. We speak truth with grace, but it's, there's truth. Because, but if I don't have that with somebody, where they don't know that I have that for them, and I speak truth, that's not easy to hear. Am I loving somebody? Um, is that helpful for building them up? I, I don't think that's always true. I don't think that's true. I think, I think that kind of love and communication has to exist within that language of love that Jesus talks about. And you're like, Melanie, what does this have to do with mental health <laughs> or mental emotional health? I think it has so much to do with it because during this time of pandemic and injustice and everything else, by the way, that's going on in our lives, each of us have our own things apart from the crises in the world, right? We each have our own situation. This takes a toll on your mental and emotional health. And I, today I wanted to talk about the emotional part of our health more than the mental, because I think Tony has, you know, kind of made that correlation between, you know, when you change how you think, it can change how you feel. But I think that emotions get a bad rap. And um, I will read my theme scripture, just so you know. Um, because I, I believe the Bible is the center of, of all that we do. And so, and not philosophy or psychology, but I want to read this thing that from an article that I read about emotions. Um, and then I want to go and look at the scripture. <clears throat> it says, you know, basically emotional emotion gets a bad rap. Um, we, we are kind of taught that emotions are, um, we don't, we're not to trust emotions. And it says, our feelings fluctuate and we don't know why. We drift in and out of the same yucky emotions. As a result, we blame much of our trouble in Christian life on our feelings. We say things like, my emotions were out of control today. And we warn each other, don't let your emotions get the better of you. 
or whatever you do, don't follow your feelings. We tag emotions as disorderly, deceptive, and dangerous. But feelings have gotten a bad rep. Many of us have unknowingly swallowed a mouthful of misconceptions about feelings, which has led to a lot of confusion over how to handle our feelings. And so I tell, this is the person who's writing the article, he says, and so I tell my daughter, if we want to fix our feelings problem, if we want to figure out how to escape emotion, the emotional rip um, currents, and if we want to experience an emotional life that is full of rich and godly feelings, we must start with God. God created emotions. He created us to feel. He wired us up with a full range of emotions according to his wise and beautiful design. He created our faculty of emotions together with our minds and our wills to serve a God and a, and a useful purpose in our lives. God is the one who fashioned each of us in his image to be thinking, acting, emotional creatures. Then he declared all things, including our feelings, very good. Very good, that is not how our feelings feel much of the time. In this fallen world, we have been grieved by various trials. Physical pain and weakness can wreak havoc on our feelings, but perhaps the most troublesome, and here's why, I'm connecting discipleship with emotions and with what I'm about to read. He said, but perhaps most troublesome of all is the sin that grips our emotions. Sin seeks to unite the whole person, mind, will, emotions, in rebellion against God. Emotions are not the problem, but they do have a sin problem. For this reason, I don't correct my daughter for being too emotional. Instead, I try to help her see the sin that has hijacked her emotions. I love that because we live in a fallen world and our emotions are going to be hijacked by sin. But instead of us just relegating emotions to the box of, oh, that, that's not good. Here's good, that's awful. Like, let's just put that disorder here, it's just terrible. He's like, your, your emotions have been hijacked. And so I think why discipleship is, in, is crucial is because in these times where we've been emotional and where we've been upset and where we've been sharing our feelings, right? <laughs> One of the things that I've seen that's crept into the church is this concept of my truth and your truth. And so my emotions that are out of control is based on my truth. And you can't tell me how to feel about my truth. Okay. That in and of itself is... There's, there is a, a thread of truth to your truth because what you're actually saying, not actually saying absolute truth, you're, you're defining your experience. What you're saying is my experience is my experience and your experience is your experience. Where we go wrong is where we tell each other, you can't tell me how to feel. Actually, I can. <laughs> and if your feelings in that moment our rebellion toward God, that I need to love you, I need to hear you, but I need to direct you back to God and say, hey, sister, I, if, I can't, if I can't empathize with them, I've never been through that, then at least I can sympathize and say, I'm so sorry. That, what you're describing sounds awful. I've never experienced that. But can I help you with something that I, I see in scripture? Because Think where you're heading can be dangerous emotionally. And I've got some thoughts that I think may help you. And here's one of the scriptures that has helped me in my battle for emotion. <clears throat> it's in Psalm 27. And I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture here. 
In verse 1, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Remember, psalms are poetry, right? They're either songs or they're poetry. They're, they're the psalmist's expression through emotion. Um, poetry is emotion. Poetry is um, using um, similes and hyperboles and all kinds of things to sort of exaggerate or bring out something that someone might be thinking and feeling um, to share an experience. So, so this is David writing this. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an enemy besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. This only do I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his holy temple. From the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I cry, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. And he goes through this whole thing. And at the end of it, he says, I remain confident of this. No matter what happens in society, no matter ha what happens in my world, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait, 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 wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. <laughs> David just had a mastery of language when he was communicating his feelings. It, it is a wonder that God said he's a man after my own heart because he was able to articulate things about God and about a relationship with God that just speak to the soul. They just do. They, they communicate something that you and I feel on a deep level, right? And I think when we're helping each other with our emotions, this is the way we've got to try to help each other. It cannot be just the, you need to stop that, or you need to do this. You need to, it cannot be those quick we need to be prayerful people and considerate people when we're helping each other on this level, right? On this, this level where emotions can run riot with us. For me, this scripture, <laughs> when I was in some of my deepest and darkest times, when David says, to dwell in the house of the Lord, that, that's, that's what I want, to dwell in the house of the Lord. Those, that, that dwelling in the house of the Lord, what my heart says is seek his face. Those are the reasons why David could say, you know, he will find the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He will see the goodness. Of, that's the reason he was able to say that, right? That, that because he had that heart to dwell, that all he wanted to do was, was dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life or see himself sheltered in the, sh in the sacred um, tent of God. That was the reason he could see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that was the reason he could say, wait, just wait, be patient with the Lord. Wait, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And so I think in these times as we're helping each other, go through whatever it is we're feeling, whether it's the current environment, this, this is where we have to take each other. We have to take each other back to God. And when we're not, when our emotions have been hijacked by sin, we need to help each other. It's not, it's not okay, sisters, for us to just say to each other, 
it's okay, she's hurting, or it's okay, it's been a bad time, or it's okay, because Satan will not let go of that stronghold in her life. And in my life, if you see it in my life, he will not let go. If he hijacks it, it's for a purpose, and he means to use it for that purpose. And he will wreak havoc with those emotions if he's hijacked them. But scripture teaches us that we have been given every blessing. We've been given divine tools to demolish strongholds. We've been given those things. And when Satan's get, say, um, <laughs> emotions get hijacked by sin, remember we've been given those divine tools to demolish those strongholds. Because according to Paul in that scripture in Corinthians, those strongholds are, are in, intended to set themselves up against God. And we can't have that. And so in helping each other, you know, even if one of us errs and we're not as sensitive to each other, right? Let's do our best to say, thank you for what you just shared. It's very hard to hear what you're saying in my current state. But can I just say, it would help me if you didn't use that tone. Maybe that tone is hurtful in that moment. Let's help each other grow. Be, from our past, when we didn't handle this concept of discipling each other well. Um, and I'm not going to say we didn't always do it well, because I think there's some things that we did great in this area of discipling. But in this current area where we've learned and we've grown, let's help each other with our emotions. Let's listen, let's feel, let's pray, but let's help each other. Because we cannot let Satan hijack our emotions. I think they're a beautiful gift from God. You know, when, when, when I'm sharing something and another woman tears up because they're hurting with me, it's beautiful. I love that I feel connected. Let's not let our emotions be hijacked by Satan. Um, and especially through this crazy time when we don't even get to hug each other. 